was necessary to use police action to keep order. Also shown is the behavior of key individuals, as well as mob action in civil rights and racial demonstrations. St. Augustine is the nation's oldest city, located on Florida's northeast coast in St. John's County, 38 miles south of Jacksonville. This ancient city of 15,000 population is one of the state's leading tourist attractions. Commercial fishing is an important industry here. Many St. Augustine families derive their livelihood from the Florida East Coast Railroad, which has been involved in one of the longest strikes and labor disputes in the history of our nation. At a time when Negroes throughout the South and across the nation have organized demonstrations and civil disorders to call attention to their demands for more civil rights, St. Augustine has had its share of conflicts. In the summer of 1963, sit-in demonstrations and shooting incidents between white and Negro youths caused considerable tension in the city. In December 1963, a St. John's County grand jury deplored the racial unrest in the county, which included a fatal shooting, beatings, rock throwing, and slashing of car tires, and blamed the violence on militant Negro leaders and the Ku Klux Klan. The jury said that the difficulty centered around the desegregation of privately owned tourist accommodations and eating establishments, like this motor lodge, shown here as Negroes attempted to obtain service, were denied and subsequently arrested. It pointed out that the conflict had adversely affected the morals, health, and general welfare of the county, but it expressed the faith that harmony could be restored. In the early spring of 1964, local Negroes began civil rights demonstrations with white and Negro sympathizers from the North participating. City and county officials arrested more than 250 persons, including Mrs. Malcolm Peabody, mother of the governor of Massachusetts. By the end of May, it was apparent that national Negro organizations had selected St. Augustine as a target city for racial demonstrations. A long, hot summer was forecast by Negro leader Martin Luther King, head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, who came to St. Augustine to organize integration efforts along with accompanying civil disobedience demonstrations designed to focus national and world attention upon the oldest city in the New World. As a means of demonstrating, large numbers of Negroes began marching through the downtown area at night. Reacting to this, large groups of white people gathered downtown where the situation became very tense. Governor Bryant ordered the Florida Highway Patrol to send troopers to assist local enforcement agencies in the struggle. The troopers were on hand to back up the St. Augustine Police Department and the St. John's County Sheriff's Office where mobs were meeting in open conflict and where shots were being fired into homes and automobiles. News photographers became a target of white segregationists who attacked the photographers and smashed their equipment on several occasions. The town's old slave market became a focal point of the demonstrations, as it apparently became a symbol of Negro efforts to integrate the nation's oldest city. Local enforcement officers used trained dogs to assist in crowd control. These dogs were effective in halting lines of marchers who would have otherwise been willing to press forward. It was estimated that one well-trained police dog could do the work equal to 10 or 12 police officers in crowd control. On June 1st, the city commission adopted an ordinance to prevent parking on downtown streets at night and to prevent minors under 19 from being on the streets or in public places between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Throughout this time, the highway patrol set up many vehicle checkpoints in the area and took into custody a large number and variety of weapons, including 
rifles, pistols, shotguns, machetes, nightsticks, blackjacks, axe handles, hatchets, and chains. These eight weapons were taken off the same person at different times in a two-day period. U.S. District Judge Brian Simpson of Jacksonville handed down an order which prohibited police forces from interfering with demonstrations following a petition by a Miami attorney on behalf of the Negroes. Following this order, more trouble developed during a night march on June 9th where more than 200 persons marched downtown to the slave market. Violence broke out when a small group of white men and youths began attacking the demonstrators, singling out white demonstrators in the group of Negroes and photographers. On June 10th, following this disorder, Florida Highway Patrol Major J.W. Jordan was sent to St. Augustine with additional troopers and officers from the Conservation Department and Beverage Department. Martin Luther King returned to St. Augustine to lead what he called a massive assault against segregation. And he said, I'm here to stay until the battle is won. King and other Negro leaders organized demonstrations in attempts to obtain service in restaurants and motels. Meetings were held in Negro churches where integration leaders would incite their members to the task at hand. Prior to the demonstrations, these meetings would take place for at least one hour. At the end of the marches, the participants would return to the churches for another lengthy session. At the same time, three white segregationists were taking the lead in organizing opposition to the demonstrations. These men were Halstead Richard Manusi, shown here in the white hat, better known as Hoss Manusi, who was head of the ancient city hunting club. Ku Klux Klan attorney J.B. Stoner of Atlanta came to St. Augustine as an outsider, to quote his words, to help these people, unquote. Stoner, who has long been a segregationist, joined with Hoss Manusi and leading marches of white segregationists into the Negro heart of town. The Reverend Connie Lynch came to St. Augustine from California to, quote, help these embattled good white people in their cause, unquote. Lynch spoke night after night to anywhere from 100 to 300 of plotting segregationists gathered on the plaza in the heart of town. Here are some brief quotes from some of his sayings. Anyone who thinks the nigger is equal to the white man is a fool. The government was intended to be of the white man, by the white man, and for the white man. Hitler was a great man. The nigger should be sent back to Africa. The white people who stand and listen to Lynch applaud and answer, Amen. But when questioned individually, some of his audience say they believe Lynch to be an extremist. While Lynch, Stoner, and Manusi aroused the white segregationists in the old slave market in downtown St. Augustine, Negro leaders in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, usually from out of state, challenged Negroes at local churches, are you willing to get beat up and go to jail for freedom? Are you willing to suffer? Don't ask me about Paul and Silas unless you're willing to do the same thing they did. Suffer and go to jail for what you know is right. Nightly demonstrations of from two to 400 Negro marches paraded to the downtown plaza around the old slave market where as many as 1,000 people would gather and gangs of up to about 150 whites attempted to attack the Negroes. Troopers who were working with city police and sheriff's deputies attempted to protect the lines of marches from the attacking white men and youths who milled around the park. New lights were installed to give enough illumination to light the old park area. Several persons were injured 
A number of arrests were made, and one state trooper was splashed with sulfuric acid, which fortunately was washed off quickly, resulting only in a slight burn. Martin Luther King Jr. and 17 other persons were arrested on June 11th in an attempt to eat in a segregated restaurant. King had been arrested about 16 times previously in other southern states in integration demonstrations. On June 15th, Governor Ferris Bryant felt the situation had become so serious that he found it necessary to invoke emergency powers to create a special state police force which had concurrent powers with Sheriff L.O. Davis and Police Chief Virgil Stewart to enforce the law. This was the first time that any Florida governor had invoked the special emergency police powers voted by a special session of the 1956 legislature and it had the effect of accomplishing with civil law officers the same thing that could have been done by sending National Guard into St. Augustine. This special police force, under the immediate command of Highway Patrol Major Jordan, was given an initial strength of about 135 patrol troopers, beverage agents, state conservation agents, game and fish officers, division of correction officers, and investigators from the governor's office, attorney general's office, and sheriff's bureau. The special force could now make arrests for violations of city ordinances or violations of any regulation promulgated by the governor. The governor had said that just assigning large numbers of state law officers to the city was not enough because they lacked the power to do what was required. The governor made a personal appeal to the people of St. Augustine. The thing that I want to say to the people of St. Augustine and Florida particularly is that we must maintain law and order. Uh, that regardless of our feelings for or against certain people, for or against certain propositions, we have a task to perform, a society to maintain, and I anticipate that we will do it. On June 17th, Negro switched tactics by marching through a white residential section in the middle of the night. The march of 300 strong included a group of Jewish clergymen from nine other states which arrived to take part in the demonstrations. A heavy escort was given to the marchers, but few white spectators watched as the marchers wound into the parking lot in front of the Munson Motor Lodge, the major target in sit-in attempts. They held prayer service and returned to the church where the march began. On this same day, 35 colored people staged a two-hour wait-in at St. Augustine Beach without incident, except that the white bathers left the area. This was the beginning of a series of daily conflicts on the beaches. A St. John's County grand jury recommended a 30-day truce in demonstrations so a biracial committee could be formed to study racial problems, but the recommendations were immediately rejected by Martin Luther King. A group of St. Augustine businessmen also issued a statement pledging to abide by present and future laws, including any civil rights bill which would give Negroes the rights they are seeking, and they expressed a willingness to sit down and discuss racial problems with a representative group of local citizens which would include Negroes. This was to no avail. On June 20th, Governor Bryant issued an emergency order banning nighttime demonstrations. The special police force of troopers and other officers was directed to enforce the order to disperse any unlawful assembly. The executive order followed a night march in which bricks and bottles were thrown as whites attempted to break up an integrationist march. Previously, city authorities had banned night demonstrations on May 28th but the curfew was knocked down by U.S. Judge Brian Simpson. Governor Bryant's order could not be directly attacked in federal or state courts. An attack would have to come in the form of a challenge of the constitutionality of the statute under which the powers are given to the state chief executive. White and Negro demonstrations were carried on separately in marches through St. Augustine on June 21st, 
and a group of whites attacked a racially mixed group of demonstrators at Atlantic Ocean Beach. Note the speed at which action develops when open conflict breaks out during these beach demonstrations. It is often necessary for several officers to pursue and subdue a single attacker bent upon striking blows and escaping. Extreme care had to be used in handling the baton during these incidents. It was difficult to grasp the wet, bare arms of the attackers, and these people often use grease on their bodies to give them an additional advantage in this regard. A Danish cameraman taking motion pictures of the violence was beaten by a shirtless white youth who fled down the beach. He was run down and apprehended several hundred yards away. The singing integrationist waded into the water and stayed for about 10 minutes. It was necessary for troopers to wade into the surf between the integrationists and whites on shore. And two conservation boats were used to help keep the groups apart. Four members of the white group were arrested. On June 23rd, Patrol Commander H.N. Kirkman sent Inspector H. Lee Simmons to relieve Major Jordan, and relief was given to other troopers who had been on the scene for some time. On June 24th, whites turned away a group of about 30 Negroes who attempted a wade in for the fourth straight day. The special police force escorted the Negroes from cars to the water's edge where the white group met them. The Negroes knelt on the sand and prayed for about 10 minutes before leaving. There were no arrests. Later, after hearing a fiery speech by segregationist Connie Lynch at the old slave market, nearly 300 whites marched into the Negro area. The marchers were confronted by a large group of sign-carrying Negroes on Washington Street. But there were no overt incidents here. This situation became tense when the white marchers returned to the downtown plaza to find Negroes marching on Cathedral Street. Officers and police dogs prevented the two groups from clashing. Several whites were arrested. On Thursday, June 25th, the most serious rioting of the whole St. Augustine disorder occurred. In the afternoon, violence erupted at St. Augustine Beach as a group of whites attacked about 75 integrationists during a wait-in demonstration. Notice the speed at which the action develops and the need for officers to pursue the attackers. It is most important to act quickly to arrest those who engage in these fights. For the first time, state officers had to use their police batons. They broke up the action in less than a minute. About a dozen persons were injured and 10 integrationists and 10 segregationists were arrested. Those arrested were removed from the scene immediately. Usually, two or more officers would control those arrested to minimize the force needed to place them in patrol cars for removal to jail. In the evening, rioting broke out in downtown St. Augustine as about 500 angry whites crashed through police lines and attacked Negro demonstrators who marched through the area at the same time whites were holding a meeting. As the 200 Negro demonstrators marched into the downtown area shortly before 8 p.m., the whites smashed through the lines of officers and disrupted the march. The Negroes were attacked for perhaps half a minute before the officers could halt the violence. The march continued around the plaza, and the whites again broke through the lines on Cathedral Street in front of the Catholic Church. As the officers tried to stop the attacking whites, the Negroes broke and ran. Some of them were overtaken and mauled before they could reach the safety of the Negro area. Note here again the speed with which action develops once open conflict erupts and individuals begin to act on their own in direct conflict with others. 
It is important to note that once this kind of action begins, it quickly spreads to others. Some 20 persons were injured, including a trooper shot by a pellet gun, a conservation officer's shoulder broken, and a beverage agent severely beaten with fists and kicked. Other officers received several less severe injuries. About 15 persons were arrested, and the schedule of bonds for various offenses was considerably increased. After a relatively quiet weekend, on Monday, June 29th, troopers formed a wedge and a protective box around demonstrators to lead them into the water at St. Augustine Beach. This maneuver, while very hard on uniforms and equipment, was successful in preventing conflict by keeping opposing sides apart. The segregationists ran around the ring of officers, pointing and jeering, and they were joined by about 100 spectators on the beach. Again the next day, the demonstrators were permitted to swim in this way. After about 30 minutes in the surf, the integrationists left under protective guard. There were no incidents and no arrests on Monday, and only one arrest on Tuesday. On Tuesday night, June 30th, integrationist and segregationist groups called off for the demonstrations after Governor Bryant appointed a biracial committee to study local racial problems. St. Augustine businessmen issued an announcement saying they would fully comply with a new pending civil rights law which was expected to take effect later in the week. As the truce was announced, most of the 235-man special police force was sent back to handle normal enforcement assignments around the state, with the exception of about 25 troopers for a skeleton force. Since June 15th, 306 persons were arrested, and this, along with an increase in bonds, were major reasons why whites agreed to the truce, it was reported. To quote one segregation leader, we just couldn't stand those bonds, particularly when they got as high as $1,500. Governor Bryant made this statement. Four St. Augustine citizens have been named by me to serve their community in the reestablishment of communications between the races. They have been asked to serve until the grand jury names a permanent committee as it moves to do in its presentment of June the 18th. During this period, it is my understanding that demonstrations will cease. The state will continue to assure law enforcement as necessary, but I anticipate that little assurance, if any, will be needed. Whether we agree with the Civil Rights Bill or not, and I, of course, do not, it is time to draw back from this problem and take a look down the long road at the end of which, somehow, we must find harmony. Upon one thing all men can agree, we cannot solve this problem through violence. Violence is anarchy, and anarchy is the enemy of freedom. Martin Luther King had this to say. In order to demonstrate our good faith and reveal that we are not seeking to wreck St. Augustine, as some have mistakenly believed, we have further agreed to call off demonstrations while the committee seeks to work out a settlement. This does not mean that the staff of SCLC will leave St. Augustine, nor does it mean that I, as president of SCLC, will disassociate myself with this community. We have committed ourselves to staying here until that is a meaningful resolution of the problems facing this community. And that is another warning signal. This move is not to be construed as a settlement. As the saying goes, every thousand-mile journey begins with the first step. The development of this development is merely the first step in a long journey toward freedom and justice in St. Augustine. But it is a creative and important first step, for it at least opens the channels of communication, something that St. Augustine has needed so long. On July 4th, about... 150 white people marched in a Ku Klux Klan parade with about 75 of these wearing robes. There were few spectators and no incidents. The Klansmen had announced they would have 5,000 members in the march. 
scattered incidents continued in St. Augustine, usually involving tests in restaurants of the new civil rights law. Martin Luther King returned to the city again and declared, the Ku Klux Klan is not going to take over St. Augustine, even if we must offer our bodies as sacrifices. It is apparent that the Florida Highway Patrol and other law enforcement agencies must be trained and prepared to cope with these disorders in the future.